Sometimes, not all the time, hell had no fury like uh, liberals who don't respond to challenging one of their idols. Meet the Democratic congressman who says, Nancy Pelosi, I respect you, I admire what you've done, but enough. It's time to step down, time for new blood, younger blood to come in. He is the Ohio Democrat, Congressman Tim Ryan. He joins us right now. He is seeking to lead the Democrats in this next Congress. Sir, good to have you. Thanks, Neil. Um, we should say we, we put out a call to Nancy Pelosi. We haven't heard back, or we did hear back, and I think she just declined. Uh, but uh, let me ask you, Congressman, why are you doing this? It's an uphill battle, but you argue it's time for change. <clears throat> Well, there was an earthquake that went through the Midwest uh, last Tuesday, and white working class, black working class, brown working class uh, folks in my district uh, rejected the, the National Democratic Party because I think we failed to talk about economic opportunity for them. And we need to move in a direction where we can connect with those workers and say that we're going to provide opportunity for them, an opportunity for increased wages, a secure pension, and a way to move forward. And we failed to do that. And I think, you know, moving forward, we have to look in a new direction to someone who can connect uh, to those working class blue collar voters all over the country and pull them back in our fold so that we can win the majority back and, and represent our people. Did you let uh, Nancy Pelosi know first of your intentions to challenge her, and what did she say? Well, I let her know first that we wanted to extend the uh, debate, and that's when we were able to move the election last week, and then I did right. uh, leave her a message that I was going to announce, yeah. Uh, the fact that you were able to move that election is in and of itself a, a big development because those things sometimes are set in stones. And she sets it. Now, she's very confident in a letter to colleagues to say she has the votes and she's a pretty good counter. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Well, she is. I mean, she's a very, very uh, skilled uh, politician, and I have a great deal of respect for her, and I love her, and, and uh, I think she's uh, terrific, but I think it is time for a change, and people in our caucus know it's time for a change. I mean, here's the question I'm asking them, Neil. So how many seats do we have to lose before we have to make a change? Because we've lost 68 since 2010. We're at the smallest number for our caucus since 1929. So what's the number? Is it we got to lose 70 seats, 80 seats, 90 seats? Like, what's the number where we're going to recognize that we are now not a national political party? And we've got to make some changes, and we've got to make them now, because if you look at the political landscape, when the Republicans are in complete control of the government, uh, the opposite party, now the Democrats, have an opportunity uh, to make some gains. But if we put you know, the same uh, leadership team out there to make the, the argument, I don't think anyone is going to come our way. And I think it's a really a missed opportunity, and it's going to damage our party and our, our ability to rebuild. And that's just how I feel. I'm not happy about that I feel that way. I take no joy in having to do this, but this needs to be done for the future of our party. Now, she's 76 years old. Her number two, Steny Hoyer, is 77. The, the average age of the Republican leadership is like 49 or 50 years old. Um, so, oddly enough, the party of, of, of old people, which is generally thought to be Republicans, this has always been an unfair rap, is the case with the House leadership. But yet, that, that, that seems to stick for her and stick together for her. What is your fear as she gets let, the, the, to be the Democratic leader again? What do you fear happening? Well, let me just say that uh, Nancy Pelosi has more energy and vigor than probably half of our caucus put together. She's uh, an amazing woman, and Steny Hoyer, uh, the same. He's got so you're not a making ton any of energy. Age reference. You're um, making just a let's shake things up reference. Well, we've got to look look at a little bit in the past. Since 2010, we've lost 68 seats. Uh, we got killed in 2010. We a few gains in 12. Killed in 14. This gained six seats this last time in an overall tidal wave that I think we all bear some responsibility for. I'm looking about moving forward. So how do we win the 30 or 40 congressional seats that we need to take back well, the majority in the House you, of Representatives? How many do you think are with you right now, or quietly say, "Hey, I'm." You know, I like what you're doing, you know, keep doing it, Tim. Yeah. Well, I'm getting a, a lot of uh, pats on the back. I think a lot of people are glad we're having this conversation. I've, I've got some 
uh, votes in my back pocket, and I'm certainly not going to reveal more people are coming out publicly um, every single day to support my candidacy. And look, I realize it's David against Goliath. I understand that. But, th you know, damn it, we got to have this conversation as a party because uh, the future of our, our party is at stake. We are not a national party right now. We can't be a coastal party. We can't lose places like Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan. Uh, you know, and we almost lost Minnesota. I mean, we, we can't well, be a national party. We'll liberal? never win the House of Representatives back. She has said it's not a matter of liberal, and she keeps referring to the fact that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. So it's not a matter of the message not hitting with Americans, uh, that Democrats should, should remain aggressively progressive. And that brings the likes of Bernie Sanders and others to the fore. Does that worry you? Look, I don't mind being progressive. I'm progressive. I'm worried about talking about being economically uh, progressive and coming up with ways to grow our economy and how do we make the United States the advanced manufacturing hub of the entire world? How do we make sure that millennials have the kind of government and economy that will allow them to thrive and take advantage of opportunity with you know, portable health care, portable benefits, portable pensions, portable workforce training money, all of these things that will allow them to thrive in a mobile economy? How do we invest into uh, advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing, these next generation of technologies that are going to allow for economic growth. I believe that there needs to be investment from the public side in partnership with the private sector to allow our economy to grow. And right now, we've not talked to working class people. We, we do talk about some of those issues, but we also got to talk to working class people, Neil, that don't want to learn how to run a computer. They want to run a backhoe. These, these men and women who take showers after work, those are the people that we're missing and the average median income in my district is fifty seven thousand dollars a year which means a husband and wife make less than thirty grand a year with a couple of kids they work very hard and they feel like the democratic party has left them that we don't care about them that we don't talk about them and the evidence is last tuesday where they left us in droves and if we don't get our act together now uh... we're going to be in a permanent minority here for a long long time and that is going to be a very unhealthy situation for our democracy our political system and our economy. Congressman, I like that line, that we take showers after work. That's well put. Congressman, thank you very, very much. <laughs> All right, and we do have a request Thanks, out to Nancy Pelosi, and again, hope springs uh, eternal that she will change her mind and come on. Years ago, you know, we interviewed her, and then she realized that we were with Fox, I guess, and just hates everything about us. Is that fair? Is that right?